So welcome back, everybody. Uh, today we're going to do we're going to start in on the Terry text. We're going to start in on some logic. This will be a fairly gentle introduction. We're not going to do anything too technical today. We've just got a couple of the core concepts to get on the table, like validity. Um, people signing up for Logic 2010? Are you getting it downloaded? At least, yeah. Okay, a few people have told me that they've forgotten their passwords from last semester. If that happens, just get in touch and send me your name and student number and your the semester that you were enrolled last, and hopefully we can get your password reset. Uh, do sign up when you sign up. Do sign up with your student number rather than your student ID. Your student number is just numbers, whereas the ID has letters in it. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, any questions about that? Any questions about the, co the course structure? That kind of thing? So I, I did get assignments for our, where we're going to write our test. Unfortunately, we did not get the exam center for the first test, so we'll be kind of scattered all over. And I think some of us will be in this room, which is sort of unfortunate, but we'll survive. The second test, at least we are in the exam center. So we'll all be together for the second test. So what I'll do is I'll send out, uh, I'll have to chunk you by last name, and I'll say, if your last name is from here to here, you're, you're in this room, last name here to there, that room. So I'll send that out close to the test. Uh, yeah? OK. Let's begin. So also, remember to fill out the doodle poll for logic lab times. If this is something you're even remotely interested in, uh, there's a, doodle, a link to a, the, a doodle poll on Quercus. Let us know when you'd be interested in showing up to Logic Lab times, and then we'll arrange them according to like when the most people want to have Logic Labs. Yeah? So hopefully we'll get that started up next week. So uh, finish, uh, do, do uh, fill out this doodle poll kind of by Friday, and over the weekend we'll figure out the schedule. Yeah? All good? Good. Right. So this is chapter zero. We're starting at chapter zero of the textbook. This is chapter zero, just the basic subject matter of the course, which is, of course, arguments. Uh, but by argument, we do not mean verbal fight. We don't mean like getting into it with somebody. We mean reasons given for another, th like, a proposition or a sentence or something like that given as a reason to believe something else. So justification is the main topic of the course. And when do some propositions justify you to believe another set of propositions? So uh, in our this is philosopher's language, the premise is a reason being given to believe something, and the conclusion is the thing that you are supposed to believe. Yeah, we, this should be familiar from you, like, your life, right? OK, good. OK, so, but logic is a normative discipline. And it tells us not just what arguments are like, but what good arguments are like. Which arguments are good ones in a fairly specific sense. Uh, that is, when are the premises given an adequate reason to believe the conclusion? And not just adequate. Well, so we don't, and we don't mean, so distinguish logic from rhetoric. So rhetoric are arguments that are likely to convince people of things, right? Just you and me, regular people, to convince them of things. Uh, but people get convinced by all kinds of bizarre things. Like if you say things in a loud, confident voice, people are more likely to believe it. Or if you're like tall, or if you repeat things over, if you just repeat the same thing over and over again, that will cause people to believe it more. And that's not what we're on about. So that's the art of rhetoric. I don't know where you learn rhetoric at a university, or where do you like? Where do you learn um, marking? Which, which one? The English department. English department. Yeah. So the English English department will teach you how to write flowing, beautiful, persuasive prose. That's not what we're doing. We're doing uh, arguments such that you should, if you were an ideal rational agent, then believe the conclusion. Yeah. So all of that humanity. Basically, the the whole topic of today is. Stripping away the humanity from your, from your reasoning and just leaving this pure, formal, crystalline purity. So uh, we're also going to focus on one specific type of argument, 
which is the deductive argument. So here's, a, here's an inductive argument. Here's an, here's an argument that's not a bad reason to believe the conclusion. So I've never gotten caught cheating on a test before. Therefore, I won't get caught this time. So the first thing is a premise. It is a premise being given as a reason to believe the conclusion. And it should like raise your confidence in the conclusion, right? If something has always happened before, if like the sun rose every day for my entire life, therefore it's probably going to rise tomorrow. That's a pretty good argument, right? But it's an inductive argument. That is, it's possible that the premises are true, but the conclusion turns out to be false. Right? That's sort of conceivable. You can imagine it. It's logically consistent. Whereas in a deductive argument, it is impossible that the premises be true and the conclusion false. So here's a deductive argument. All gold is metal. Suppose I have a chunk of gold. This is gold. Therefore, this is metal. Now, that's not just a reasonably good argument. That's what's called a deductively valid <laughs> argument, such that it cannot be the case that the premises are true while the conclusion is false. Now, Nothing in this, just this argument should convince you that those premises are absolutely unquestionable. So if I hand you something and I say, this is gold, you're not like, well, logic says I have to believe you, right? So the premises can be questionable. The premises could be, you know, of dubious quality. But what we know about this argument is that it's deductively valid. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion must follow. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. We're just doing deductive argumentation. There are courses at this, institu in, uh, at this institution on inductive argument. I think PHL 246 is probabilistic reasoning. Uh, but they basically assume that you know this deductive stuff first. So the deductive case is the simplest, easiest case. And then inductive arguments are, frankly, more complex to say when they're good or when they're bad. We will be able to say, by the end of this course, exactly when a deductive argument is good. Okay, so a deductive argument is what's called truth preserving. So you get out exactly as much truth as you put in. In some important sense, a deductive argument just unpacks what was already in the premises, right? Things, th things that are logical implications of the premises just kind of get unpacked. And what you show in a deductive argument is that the conclusion says nothing over and above what the premises said. Right? So there's nothing in the conclusion that wasn't already implicitly in the premises. And therefore, however true the premises were, the conclusion will be as well. Now, you can have a deductive argument with totally bogus premises. You can have a deductive argument with completely false premises. But it still has, so long as it has this property of being truth preserving, it's a deductive argument. Yeah? OK. So far, so good. So uh, this is kind of the central concept of the class, or this, this lecture is validity. Uh, you, need, you need to get validity. So an argument is valid. Here's, so this is straight from the textbook. An argument is valid if and only if there is no logically possible situation in which all of its premises are true and its conclusion false. OK. So we'll show you a bunch of examples of this uh, and a, what, it, what it kind of means. But this is the, the notion of logical validity. Yeah? OK. So here are a bunch of possible situations. So green, let's say green means that the thing is true. Red means that it's false, right? And the top things are premises. The P means premise. And the bottom things are conclusions. So to say something is valid rules out only one of these situations. Right? You can have a valid argument with three of these configurations. Only one of them is ruled out. So you want to tell me which one? Yeah. Number two. Number two, precisely. That's the only situation that's impossible. So if this argument is valid, it cannot be that the premises are true and the conclusion is false. However, so uh, the one that you want valid, so you, when, when you say valid, you mean good, nice, appealing, something that I want. And this is the one that's good, nice, appealing, and something that you want, right? This is what's called a sound argument, where it's both valid and the premises are true. 
That's nice, because it guarantees the truth of the conclusion. But these two can also be valid arguments. So you have false premises and a true conclusion. It can still be a valid argument, right? Because it's truth preserved. If in just in case it's truth preserving. Not all arguments that are like this are valid. So with invalid arguments, all four are possible, right? An invalid argument can have any of these connections. So you can't tell that an argument is valid just by whether, for example, its premises are true or by whether its conclusion is true. You need to know that the premises are true and the conclusion is false to determine that an argument is invalid, okay? Or you need to know logic. So this is, this is mainly what we're gonna spend a bunch of time doing is trying to determine how argu whether arguments are valid based on their form. So we'll get to, we'll get to this. So this is just what I've been saying. A valid argument can have false premises. It's perfectly okay. So if I say I have six legs, everybody who has six legs is charming, therefore I am charming, that is a perfectly valid argument. But notice, I don't have six legs. Yeah? Okay, so the premise was false, but the argument was valid because if the premises were true, then the conclusion would be necessary. The conclusion would follow with certainty. I'm, I'm hammering away at this because, I, not because I think that it's conceptually difficult, but because people have this really strong tendency to mush together validity and truth of the premises. Uh, so people have what's called, I think it's called belief bias, where if the premises are true, you're more likely to believe that the argument is valid, which is just a kind of mental mistake that people systematically make. And it's, it's fairly difficult to tease these apart, like in practice. Yeah. So as far as validity, the only two options are invalid or valid? That's right. That's right. So we're not dealing with any of the, so, I mean, okay, so we're doing, we're doing kind of basic logic here. Uh, we're, not, we're just doing deductive logic. In the, in the world of inductive logic, you can have strong or weak arguments where like, this is a really compelling but not certain argument. Or you can have a weak argument where it's like, oh, uh, you know, it's sort of an argument but not really. In deductive logic, it is either valid or invalid. So either the premises guarantee the conclusion or they do not follow. Yeah. So Uh, that relativizes it to what you can prove. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is uh, show the rule, like basically the whole course is going to be rules for determining when an argument is valid. Uh, so we'll, we'll answer that question in considerable depth. Yeah. yeah. Can you give an example of an invalid argument where the premises are true? Sure, sure. Uh, all actors are vain. Tom Cruise is an actor, therefore Tom Cruise is vain. So that's invalid. It's invalid, and you can tell by the form of the argument. So if you flip, that, flip the premises to something that's structurally the same, but are more obvious, so all triangles have straight sides, squares have straight sides, therefore all triangles are square. It's clearly not a good argument, but it was structurally the same. Yeah? Okay, we'll do a couple of examples of invalid arguments, I think. Okay, uh, one addendum to this. So we're going we're gonna to get real picky here. We're going to get real picky about definitions and stuff. So here are a couple of cases where you can have trivial validity. These are cases where you have a valid argument that's not valid in the way that you would think it's valid. So... Uh, an argument with contradictory premises is automatically valid. So if I say it is raining outside and it is not raining outside, therefore the moon is made of green cheese, that's a valid argument by the definition of valid argument that we just gave. So why is that? Take a look at this, art, this definition of validity. If there is no logically possible situation in which all of its premises are true, and its conclusion is false. So what happens if you've got contradictory prem premises that are, that one says X and one says not X? That means there's no situation in which all of the premises are true, 
right? So there cannot be a situation where the premises are true and the conclusion's false. That's, a, that's like, you can't have the first part of the two-parter. It's a two-parter definition, true premises, false conclusion. It has to be possible with, that there are true premises, false conclusion. So if the premises are contradictory, that they can't all be true at the same time, then it automatically satisfies this definition of validity. Yeah? Um, in that instance, it is possible that it could be raining outside and not raining outside because outside is quite bad. Well, for any definition of outside, it cannot be the case that. So if you specify the scope of what you mean by outside, then it comes out that you can't have both. Yeah? Just a recap. So you can have two conflicting premises, but the conclusion can be true in this argument? Well, so, uh, no, so in the in the example that I just gave, you have uh, conflicting premises. Yeah, suppose the tr the the premises are the conclusions too. So it's either it's raining and it's not raining, and I'm wearing shoes, or therefore I'm wearing shoes. Sorry, that's a valid argument. It's a dumb argument. Doesn't make sense, but it's valid. Yeah. So fallacies are typically, we deal with fallacies in informal reasoning. That's a, it's a terrible argument. So don't, don't think, so what, what I want you to do here is to separate the idea of validity from being a good argument, right? So it's not a good argument to say it's raining and it's not raining, therefore I won the gold medal in the sprint, right? But that's nonetheless a valid argument, yeah? So don't offer people arguments like that and be like, well, it's technically valid, don't do that. <laughs> But on our definition of validity, it is valid. Yeah? Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble teasing this. So basically, you can just make contradictory statements, and then the last statement, as long as it has, as long as it has okay. to do with nothing, it's correct. Like, you so, can say, it's raining, it's not raining, and I have blue hair. It doesn't, in this case, be, OK, so look, at the, so look at the definition of validity here. It's got two parts. An argument is valid. If there's no situation, there's no case, there's no possibility in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So you can show that, that, that there's no such possibility if you just show that there's no situation in which the premises are true. Right? If the premises contradict each other, then there's no situation in which the premises are true. So there can't be a situation in which the premises are true and the conclusion is valid or the conclusion, sorry, valid, is true, yeah? So it, the truth of the conclusion here doesn't matter. You've already satisfied the definition of validity just by showing there's no possible situation where the premises are true. Similarly, you can do the opposite and say an argument with a conclusion that is true by definition, we call it a tautology, is automatically valid. So if I say I walked here from work, Therefore, it's raining or it's not raining. It's raining or it's not raining. That is automatically valid because there's no possible situation. Because the conclusion is logically like, guaranteed just by the structure of the sentence, that means there's no situation in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Yeah? OK, so these are weird, picky cases. But nonetheless, we're going to get real picky. Maybe not that weird. It's not going to be like a wild and wacky course. It's, it's logic. But uh, we're nonetheless going to get super duper picky. So that's the, just to set the tone and to explore the notion of validity a little bit. Yeah? OK. OK, so one way of, sh to, let's, let's keep exploring this a little bit. One way of showing that an argument is invalid is to find a case where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So if you can show that the premise, you know, you, okay, here, imagine this and imagine a situation in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false, that shows that the argument was invalid. So here's an argument. I had either eggs or cereal for breakfast, premise one, premise two, I had either juice or coffee with breakfast, therefore I had either eggs or juice. OK, so this is an invalid argument, right? It is possible that the premises are true while the conclusion is false. So what's a case 
what's a, imagine for me a, a scenario in which these premises are true and the conclusion's false. Yeah? They had cereal and coffee? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if I had cereal and coffee for breakfast, then I had either eggs or cereal is true, right? Because I had cereal. And I had either juice or coffee is true because I had coffee. So the premises are true, but it's not true that I had either eggs or juice. Yeah? So what we've done is shown that this argument is invalid by finding a case where the premises are satisfied and the conclusion is false. Uh, we're not going to do a whole lot of this stuff in this form. We'll do a little bit with truth tables and a little bit at the very end of the course with uh, models, but just to, just to get the idea of this. So it was either hot or cool out today, premise one. It wasn't cloudy. Therefore, it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. What's a scenario that makes those first two things true and the third thing false? Yeah. 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 It was either hot or cool out today, and it wasn't cloudy. So we're imagining that those true. It wasn't cloudy or it was hot. It would be and or. It's an or statement. You can do either one. Right, right. Uh, so if it's the case that, oh, shit. I think I wrote, I think I made a typo. <laughs> OK, good. So that would make this a valid argument. So there's no, if it's the case that, uh, it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. So it, if it was cloudy, if the first two things are true, then it definitely wasn't cloudy. Therefore, it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. Yeah? Yeah. I, think, I don't think it's valid because I think or implies like it's either one or the other, right? So it's possible okay. for it to be both cloudy and hot. Okay, good. So this is something we should clear up fairly, fairly straightforwardly. It depends. So in this case, it depends on which kind of or you mean. In this class, when we say or, we're going to mean inclusive or. So th therefore, I did get it wrong. <laughs> OK, so uh, the inclusive or says, so if, if, if this or is inclusive, that means uh, it's this third sentence is true in case either one of them are true. So if it's cloudy, if, so if it wasn't cloudy, then it's true that it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. And if it was hot, then it's true that it wasn't cloudy or it was hot. I don't think I made a typo. I think I put a valid argument in here and then was going to be like, is this valid or invalid? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to small exclusive ors with either? No. No. Uh, you'll have to, basically, you'll have to learn from the context. And almost, so this will matter in symbolization. You'll have to look at the sentence and figure out uh, whether you're saying either or inclusive or exclusive. In almost all of the work that we're going to be doing, it's not going to be sentences. It's going to be just a logical symbol or, and that'll have just a clear fixed meaning. So when we're doing derivations, we're doing tr truth tables, all that stuff, it will just be, it will always be the inclusive or. Yeah. I forgot that I put a valid argument in here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK. Yeah? OK. OK, so this time I'm not going to jump the gun. I'm going to ask you, is this valid or invalid? And if it's invalid, this, by the way, these are, these are examples basically from the textbook with different concepts plugged in. So there's a bunch of these in the textbook, a bunch of exercises of this style. Uh, so the argument is, the reading was complicated and difficult. The reading was tedious. Therefore, the reading was complicated and tedious. Is it valid? OK, so there's no possible situation in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Is that right? So if the, readings was comp were, were, if the reading was complicated and difficult, that gives us the first half of the, premise, or the conclusion that the reading was complicated. And if the reading was tedious, that gives us the other half. So there's really no possible situation in which the first two things are true and the conclusion is false. Yeah? You 
You can tell the question is getting less rhetorical, and now I'm actually asking you whether I did the slide right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay? Okay, so just by way of a couple of examples, what we're looking for here, okay, so like, that was weird and kind of like, what do you mean by possible? That was, by, by the way, if you, the subject of my PhD dissertation could be summed up as, what do you mean by possible, anyway? So, and I, I took me 180 pages to answer that, so it's kind of complicated to say what you mean by possible, uh, and maybe you don't want to deal with all that complication. We, in this class, are not going to deal with all of that complication. We're not going to have complex, subtle judgments about possibilities. Uh, what we're going to do instead is analyze the logical form of arguments. The logical form. So if two arguments have the same form, and one has true premises and a false conclusion, then you can say that it's invalid. Right? So what we want to do, instead of having to deal with the complexities of possibility, what we want to do is extract the form of the argument, and then analyze whether the form is valid. So an example from before, uh, I had either eggs or cereal for breakfast. I had either juice or coffee with breakfast, therefore I had either eggs or juice. Is that valid or invalid? Well, here's an argument with the same logical form that, to my mind, is much clearer. So, so that you know, my, mom, my mom's name is Leslie. So, either a frog or Leslie is my mother. That's true, because Leslie is my mother. Either a cat or Leslie is my mother. Also true, because Leslie is my mother. Therefore, either a frog or a cat is my mother. Yeah? Okay, so it's got the exact same logical form, but this time it's pretty obvious that the first two things are true and the third thing is false, right? It is to me, and if you, know, if you happen to know my mom and that she's not either a frog or a cat, then it should be obvious this time that that's an invalid argument, yeah? Okay. So what we'll do is extract the form thusly. So this is, this is the beginnings of predicate logic, where we're going to symbolize sentences, certain kind of sentences, with letters. So the logical form of this argument is P or Q, R or Q, therefore, the three dots mean therefore, typically, P or R. Yeah? And that is an invalid argument. And you can tell just by the form of the argument. So uh, just for convention, we're going to represent sentences with letters from P to Z, capital letters from P to Z. Uh, and more specifically, not just sentences in general, propositions. So what uh, philosophers talk about propositions, which is a sentence of a certain type that is a sentence that asserts something that could be true or false. Right? So there's lots of sentences that don't do that. There's lots of sentences that don't have what we call a truth value. The truth value is whether it's true or false. But if I ask you, you know, uh, if I ask you a question, have you, have you stopped being an alcoholic? Is that question true or false? It's kind of mean, right? It's a little invasive, but it's not true or false. Or if I give you a command, if I say, sit down and shut up. That's not true or false, is it, right? It's just I'm saying something to you that I want to happen. It's not a true or false sentence. Whereas a proposition asserts something about the world that could be either true or false. There's actually only like one kind of thing in the universe that can be true or false, and that's propositions. So people talk about true arguments all the time, and that doesn't Arguments are not true or false. The sentences, the propositions that make them up are true or false. OK. OK. So just, just by way of saying goodbye to some things, uh, this, is, this is mostly for the humanities students in the room. Here are some things that we're going to ignore for the rest of the class. So, so goodbye to all of this. So implicature. So here's, 
here's an implicature. So if I say everyone in the class other than Susan is doing very well, Susan takes a deep breath and says, oh God, what have I done, right? So, but that's logically consistent with Susan having done well, right? So if I say everybody in the class is doing well except Susan and Susan is doing well, those are logically consistent statements. The implicature of everyone's doing well except Susan is that Susan isn't doing well. Because why wouldn't you say, why would you pick her out and not say anything about her? Right? It implies that and it, 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 the, the sort of the, the way people use language in a normal everyday human context has this implicature. If I say, you know, how's Tom doing at work? And you say, well, he's very punctual. Right? If, you, if that's all you have to say, then that means he's doing badly in all the others. But that's not a logical implication. That's a conversational implicature. Yeah? And we're not doing any of that in this class. Right? So forget about all the rich, subtle complexity of language. Gone. Right? So goodbye. Okay. Yeah? Context. Hey, you know how you know stuff about the world? Forget about it. Just forget it. So uh, let, let the sentence P be represented by, let, let P equal uh, my sandwich was full of poison. Let Q be I ate my sandwich. And R be I was poisoned. Now, if you are a reasonable, sensitive, humane person, you will automatically go, ah, well, P and Q together imply R. Right? Because you know what those sentences mean. Right? Okay, well, forget all that. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're not doing that. So if I, give you, if I give you P and Q, you cannot infer from those. Even though they mean, you know, based on the meaning of those sentences, you can tell that they imply R. You've got to forget that that's the case. There won't be much opportunity for confusion on these points, to be honest. I'm just sort of like, we're just sort of waving goodbye to the common sense aspects of life. Yeah? Okay, so I think, I think that this is a perfectly good argument as it stands. So if I just gave you those sentences, no, so, thank, thank you, thank you, valid. So my sandwich is full of poison, I ate my sandwich, therefore I've been poisoned. Like, that's a good argument, right? It's a very convincing argument. But if I give you P and Q, you cannot derive R from that. Why? Because we're dealing with the logical form of the argument. Yeah, so you're ignoring the fact that there is a relationship between R and P and Q ahead of time. Exactly. Unless we stay in the definition of P, R, and Q. Well, so even if I give you, so even if I give you you know, here's what P means, here's what Q means, here's what R means. You cannot, in this class, for the purposes of this class, you have to just forget the meaning and content of the, of the sentences. So we're leaving behind. So what we're focusing on is logical form. So if, basically, if I give you a different sentence for P, if P says, I'm wearing shoes, and Q says, I have a cat, then I'm wearing P and Q don't imply R anymore, right? It's only based on the meaning of the sentences that you see an implication between these, right? It's by understanding the content of the sentences that you see the, the, the relationship between P, Q, and R. And in this class, we're not doing that. We're forgetting that we understand the meaning of sentences and just thinking about the logical form of arguments. Yeah. You're getting, it, you're getting the issue wrong. You're getting the issue wrong. It's a valid argument, perfectly valid argument, right? It's, but it's not valid based on, if I'm just symbolizing this as P, Q, and R, then P and Q does not imply R. Does that make sense? Like, you, it's a valid argument if you understand the meaning of the argument. And we're, we'll get to the point, actually, by the end of the class, I think we'll get to the point where we could symbolize this as a valid argument, but just as the sentences. P and Q, if I just give you P and Q, you don't get to infer R, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, so what I'm saying is like, if you add those sentences where it's like, if P and Q, then R. 
then you get a valid argument. OK, sorry, yes. So yes, so if I say p and q, and that I have another sentence that says, if p and q then r, then you can imply, then you can uh, get r. But that's, the, that's true, not because you understand these sentences, but because of the form of that argument. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Let me go back to that point. But so what I could see from if you knew what p and q are, so if I wrote p and q is dot three dot and r, and this is the format, that still would be a valid argument? No, that would be wrong. That would be completely wrong. Okay, so the so <coughs> those are different. Those are different. So uh, the three dots is the implies. Three dots is the therefore. Okay. Uh, conditional is a bit different than implies. Okay. We'll 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 get back to that. Actually, we'll start in on that next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, so again, again, you're, you're being a sensitive, intelligent, context-sensitive person. I want you to stop doing that. I want you to stop, forget about all that. This is, this is why we're saying goodbye to all this stuff. So if I have P and Q, and I have if P and Q then R, then you can, you can get R no matter what P and Q say. So if, if P is I'm wearing shoes, and Q is I have a cat, and R is the moon is made of green cheese, then if P and Q then R, and you have P and Q, then you get the moon is made of green cheese, right? Because of the logical form. Again, separate validity from things like this is a sensible argument that makes sense that you'd be willing to say to another human, right? So that's a valid argument. P and Q, therefore R, and you have P and Q, then you get to infer R regardless of the content of those sentences, right? So what we're separating out is the form from the content. Yeah? So the difference between saying P and Q implies, or P and Q, P and Q, therefore, P and Q, therefore P and Q implies R, or P and Q, X, X, K, Q, therefore R. Is that one deductive or one inductive? Oh, uh, one is, so for our purposes, one of those arguments works, and one of them just doesn't. Uh, I wish I had a blackboard here. So yeah, you can't, yeah, yeah. We'll, the, the rules for what, what counts as a, as a valid argument will be the whole topic of the course. So the, we'll, we'll, do this, we'll do this in great detail. So like, this is, again, this is mostly for the humanities people who are like, you know, you're smart people, you're good at taking context into account. You know, you're, you're good at making these like, well, I understand deeply what this thing says, and that's how I'm dealing with it. So I'm, I'm saying right now is a good time to wave goodbye to that, right? And I'm not saying that that skill isn't valuable. It is incredibly valuable. What makes you good writers, by the way? You sciences students, you're wonderful people. You're incredibly smart, incredibly hardworking, but you cannot write. I'm sorry. <laughs> On average, on average. Many, I'm sure that you, you personally are the exception, whoever you, who's, you're the exception, but on average, uh, science students can't write because they're not as good at dealing with the subtleties and complexities of context and content, right? We're not doing that here. That's not what we're doing. We're doing the form of the argument. So you shouldn't have to know anything about the world. You shouldn't have to know any facts, right? You shouldn't have to understand anything to do well in this class, yeah? So the examples from the textbook are American presidents. And he's like, whoa, I don't know anything about American presidents. Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all, right? Because the form is what we're focusing on, yeah? And so I would like to make the case to you, I would like to I'll, let me make the pitch that even if your goal is to become the good context sensitive, you know, you want to be the humanities person who's like got good at, you know, reasoning with content, you should want to nonetheless master just the form side of things. You should want to be able to deal with just the form, because then you have both, right? Then you have both the ability to deal with the formal aspects of what you're looking at and the content. That's the ideal situation, yeah? That's where you want to be. So for you 
non-writers, for people who don't do a lot of writing, I recommend that you also master the contextually sensitive, subtle complexities of language part. Uh, but we'll do the, what we're doing here is the form, the form of the argument. OK, good. Uh, we're also going to ignore time. I think some of you were, were uh, trying to get time into, into this argument. We're just, so there's a whole, there's a whole set of logic, like logical systems. So, by the way, what I'm, what I'm going to teach you this semester is one logical system among many. And it's pretty much the simple, we're going to start from the simplest logical system. We'll move up to like medium level complexity ones. But there are a whole bunch of logics that deal with aspects of language that we are not going to deal with. For example, time. Uh, it was the case that. It will be the case that. It is always the case that. I'm not doing any of that. All right? Yeah? Is there a course here that does deal with time? Temporal logic. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, actually. Uh, it would be a higher level logic class in the philosophy department. Uh, or relativity, I guess. Maybe physics. Uh, yeah. OK, so again, we just say goodbye to all this stuff. All this, all this subtle complexity that you understand about the world, your embeddedness in a temporal structure. Goodbye. Yeah. Not off the top of my head, no. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. OK. Uh, another thing that we're going to be ignoring, vagueness. So how hard does it have to be raining in order for you to say that it's true that it's raining? Is it OK if it's, if it's just spitting a little bit? Is it raining? If it's just kind of misty, is it raining? That's a good question. We're going to ignore all that. No, we're going to ignore all of that. We're going to assume for the whole course that things are either completely true or completely false. There is no in-between for us. Again, this is not true of all logical systems. There are logical systems that deal with intermediate truth values, fuzzy logics, they call them. They're cute and fuzzy. Uh, but we are going to assume that things are either completely true or completely false. And there's no, there's no in-between. There are, there are also logical systems that deal with, OK, and also, like, if somebody's lost half their hair, are they bald? I'm like, nah. What's the, exact, what's the exact number of hairs that somebody has to have lost in order to count as bald? Uh, it's, let's not do that. We're not going to do that. Let's not do that. Good question. It's a perfectly fine question. So the question, this, is, this will come up. The first part is sentential. So a sentence is either true or false. The second part is where we're going to do in predicate logic, where we apply properties to objects to say, does this object have this property? And there's a lot of vagueness in that in the real world, which we will ignore. Yeah? OK. And finally, ambiguity. One morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know, quoth Groucho Marx. So that's, and we said, we're not even, so in this class, it's not even that we're going to ignore ambiguity. We are going to actively hunt it down and shoot it like the proverbial elephant. We are going to try to eliminate, one of the points of doing this is to try to represent, so this is an ambiguous sentence. That's why if you found it mildly funny, it's because it was it played on the ambiguity. That's how puns work. Uh, what we're going to do is try to represent sentences in ways that fail to be ambiguous, right? that are unambiguous, such that you can say exactly. So if you represented this in logic, it wouldn't be funny at all. Yeah, so we're going <laughs> to, this is, this is our goal. So we're just going to like kill all of the sensitivity and, and humanity in our souls, and it'll just wither away and die. And afterwards, you'll be pure and austere and machine-like in your soul. Like you'll just be completely devoid of any of the subtle complexities that make you a human being. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, it'll come back once you're done. Once you've written the exam, all of that will come rushing back. OK. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, next time, we'll get into symbolizing conditionals and negation. Thanks, everyone. Uh, you don't have to clap. Thank you. <laughs>